Um, hello, thank you. Um, good morning. So now, uh, after this wonderful presentation, um, I am talking about uh, vaccination and immune-mediated disease. Um, by heart, I'm kind of an immunologist, so I'm very fascinated by the subject. But I really love Clarence's uh, presentation. She always gives gives on on Tuesday about the bar, and you know, you, so I'm trying to keep this very simple. But if I'm advancing too much and I go into my immunology world, please don't hesitate to just stop me and say, "Well, I just didn't understand," and don't wait until the end of the presentation. Okay. So um, this is the objectives of the class that. Um, that we're, uh, I'm, I'm kind of covering not all of them because 25 minutes is very short and this is a lot of, um, of topics. Um, so at the end of the talk, you should be able, um, to, uh, cite and know the existence of vaccine induced unexpected immune responses. Uh, you should be able to describe mechanisms that regulate the immune response to self antigens and that prevent related autoimmune diseases. And I put this in bold because I'm kind of concentrating on this part, uh, which is going to help you to better assess if there is uh, an immune cause for any vaccine-related immune diseases you may, you may find. Um, then um, you will be able to define a logical analytical process to assess the causality of suspected autoimmune adverse effects. And I'm covering very briefly um, the example of narcolepsy. Um, which you have all heard about um, a lot. Um, and um, at the end, I will briefly talk about approaches um, that you could use uh, to assess in advance um, the risk of immune-mediated manifestations when you design a new vaccine. So this was a lot of words. Um, now just do a little quiz just to warm up and get everybody uh, up to speed. So um, is there a confirmed association between a vaccine and an unexpected immune response? Yes or no? We will make this very, uh, very quick. Um, so we'll start with HPV vaccination and multiple sclerosis or rheumatic diseases. Is there any association confirmed? Who says yes? And who says no? Great. And the others, I'm not... I'm <laughs> Uh, HPV and multiple sclerosis and rheumatic diseases. Uh, is there an associated confirm, um, a confirmed association who says yes? And who says no? Great. I think I, I just can leave, right? <laughs> um, adjuvanted vaccines. There is the so-called Asia, Asia syndrome, the, um, autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvants. Very, um, variable clinical manifestations. Is there an association that is confirmed or no? Yes? Who says yes? Who says no? Uh, very uh, so i'm kind of useful for something um mmr vaccination and idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura is there an association who says yes who says no perfect and i uh, do you know covid 19 vaccines um and thrombocytopenic thrombosis who says yes and who says no very good you're going to hear about this later on uh, during today's talks so the first two we were all kind of agreeing it was no the third one, um, there is no confirmed association. Um, and then MMR uh, and adenovirus vaccination, yes, there is. And I'm going to cover this, uh, the immune pathways kind of uh, during the talk. So this was just to warm up. Now, how to assess associations. Before you have heard to assess causality, there is several things we need. We need the event to be specific. There needs to be a temporal relationship. There needs to be consistency of evidence and a strong association, statistically significant. Um, and there should be a biological pl plausibility uh, that this event uh, is um, vaccine-related and this immune disease. So the problem with immune-mediated diseases, as you all know, they're really, really rare. Huh? So if you have something that occurs once in 10,000, 100,000 or 1 million, all these first four things are really difficult to to um, to reach or to uh, and the the other thing the the biological plausibility gives you some reasoning right um, and I would like to show you that the first four things are difficult to assess in these immune related diseases by showing you a simple example of the HPV vaccination so. HPV vaccination and autoimmune disease. The first two questions are, um, are these events specific? And is there a temporal relationship? So when we look into women of all ages in France and we see when 
they have the multiple sclerosis diagnosed. You see here that it starts kind of 10 years old. And then you have this peak between 20 and 30, 35, and then it decreases over time. And what happens at the same time is where the age at the first HPV vaccine dose is kind of between 9 and 15, and then sometimes until 25 when we catch up. So the problem that we, we face here is kind of the same problem as the cat problem, right? This keeps happening. I mean, how heavy are cats, right? <laughs> so it's really hard to be sure and to assess that, right? that there is a temporal relationship. Oops. And then the next question about the, um, the coherence and the, um, the strength of association. What you need to have is uh, not many, many um, patients you need to have different studies in different countries and different contexts that all show the same thing to kind of be more sure that there is an association, right? And so here it's just another example of HPV vaccines, a meta-analysis that has been done. And you see uh, one here is, um, here is the one, the odds ratio. You see that there is some that are higher and some that are even lower risks, but you also see that there is no consistency of evidence and there is no statistical significant association uh, when we look into these meta-analysis. So this is difficult for events that are rare. Right? So now we can come to the biological plausibility and coherence. And this is what the talk is more focusing on. The question is, how can immunology and understanding of immunology help us to assess causality? So first of all, starting from another side, so you want to have an autoimmune disease. I mean, what do you need to have an autoimmune disease? So you can have genetic predisposition, like different HLA types, um, environmental factors. So this is all very vague. Um, and all these leads to autoreactive, uh, naive T or B cells. So autoreactive means they recognize self-antigens. And this is naive cells, right? So you have heard about these naive cells coming from the thymus or coming from the bone marrow. Um, and then you need these cells to be induced. So this is what Claren told you all about, right? They need to uh, either be at the bar, right, for the B cells, uh, or they need to be induced uh, by the training, by the um, antigen-presenting cells for the T cells. So to be induced, you need to have access to the self-antigen, right? Because you need to show them what they should learn and what they should be specific for and be reactive against. And then this is not enough. You only need to tell them, well, you, there's danger, right? So you need to be effective. So I activate you. And then you become either an effector T cell, so an effector T cell that can kill, right? Kill infected cells or self cells. Or you are an B cell, you have been at the bar, and now you produce antibodies that are directed against something of yourself. Okay? So this just means that you can detect these type of cells or antibodies in your blood. Does this mean that you are sick? No. It just means you have them. And this is called autoimmunity, right? This is not a disease, it's just autoimmunity. And then what do you need next when you have these cells? Well, then you need your whole system that regulates the activity of these cells to not work, right? So regulatory T cells, for example, or other mechanisms that stop immune responses, they need to be not functional or be kind of somewhere a hole, right? Where they can pass through. And then when you have this, they can be active. But this is not enough, right? I mean, you can have a cell that is active against whatever, which is not important in your body and you have something else that can replace it. So these things need to be targeting really important cellular structures and you need to have a clinical effect, right? Afterwards. And these functional effects that can take some time to appear, right? So if I vaccinate you today and then tomorrow you have something, the likelihood that all this has happened before 
is very, very low, right? Because these naive cells have to go to school, they have to learn, they have to be activated, etc. And then they have to target something, which then needs to show you that it doesn't work anymore. So this takes some time. Okay, so this is all what you need to have an autoimmune disease. Now, your body is really good, right? Because otherwise we would all be dead, right? I mean, if this would not work. So there is lots of mechanism that regulate all this. And this is something where I would like to spend some time with you to help you even more understand and see how good the body is and how much it would need to induce such a disease. So one concept is called the central tolerance. This is the first thing that happens when you have T cells and B cells in development. Do you remember where the T cells and B cells come from? Very, very early first thing come from the bone marrow, no? I've heard. Okay. And then the T cells, they go where to differentiate? I mean, they're not yet T cells when they go there. It's the thymus. Thymus is T cell, no? Very good. And so if you look into this T cell development, we take an example here. So you have self-reactive thymocytes or T cells. And these in the thymus are presented to self-antigens, right? So there is cells in the thymus. Their only work is to show to T cells, something of ourselves, of all the organs, and then kind of filter and say, okay, do you recognize me? And do you recognize me really well or not? No. So if you recognize me really well and you really, really strongly bind to me, then I kill you. <laughs> if you kind of recognize me, but not too much, well, then I let you live. But then you either become a T cell that regulates other T cells, that is kind of a gatekeeper, well, or you get out of the system and you are a self-reactive T cell, naive T cell. Similar things happen to the B cells. And um, at the end, you have kind of 1% of the B cells that can recognize self-antigen that go into the periphery. Okay, But all the others, kind of 50 to 99%, they are all killed. Right, So it's very, very little. So this is your first filter. Right? So you have few cells that come out. This is central tolerance. Then it goes into the periphery, and there we have peripheral tolerance. So the peripheral tolerance mechanisms, we will start with the B cells, and then after we look into the T cells, because B cells, it's a bit easier. T cells is a little bit more complex because there are many more regulatory mechanisms for T cells. So if you have uh, a B cell that could potentially produce autoantibodies, then you go to Clarence Bar, no? And at Clarence Bar, in the germinal center, these B cells, they talk to the follicular helper cells, as you remember. Um, and then they can differentiate either into a memory B cell or into an antibody producing uh, B cell, a plasma cell, right? So this, for this to happen, you need T cells first that recognize the same antigen, right? Or... These T cells, if they do so, they are regulated by regulatory T cells, for example. So this kind of TB crosstalk is something that inhibits B cells to differentiate if they don't have that T cell partner, so they cannot become an IgG-producing plasma cell, right? So this is something of a gatekeeper. But it's not as efficient as is mechanisms for T cell regulation, because T cells are killers, right? So you need to really, really well regulate them. So this is the B cell part. Now we look at the T cell part. So you are a self-reactive naive T cell. You come freshly out of the thymus. And then you go into the periphery, to a lymph node, for example. And there you meet your antigen-presenting cell that presents self-antigens because this is what you are supposed to be specific for, right? So the first mechanism that you have here is that you have the so-called antigen sequestration. What does this mean? It means that very fragile sites, for example, the central nervous system, or for example, the eyes or the testes, they are immunoprivileged sites. So you don't have really access to the antigen so quickly or so easily. You need an inflammation or a huge infection that, for example, you have the brain a blood barrier that is kind of hold or whatever, and you have access there that cells can go there and you can present things. So it's a bit more difficult to get access to these uh, antigens. But this is not the main mechanism. It's just one of them. So you have this T cell and you have been presented with self-antigen. 
Then you need co-stimulation, no? co-stimulation given by, uh, for example, the antigen presenting cell at the same time. Um, and you need this kind of danger signal and an inflammatory environment to then differentiate into a self-reactive effector T cell. What are the mechanisms here to stop this kind of immune response? You have, first of all, so-called energy. So you have a T cell that recognize uh, the self antigen on an antigen presenting cell, but there is no danger signal. So this T cell is kind of frozen. I mean, there's energy. And if you want to reactivate the cell afterwards, you can't. It just, it doesn't die, but it doesn't do anything anymore. It can't do anything anymore. It's kind of paralyzed. So this is one mechanism. The next is, once it's activated, then there is lots of gatekeepers and molecules that do that you kind of want to kill this cell by a time, right? Because otherwise we would all react against everything all the time. So it need, we need to stop this reaction. And this is called the activation-induced cell death. There's mechanisms, complicated, doesn't matter. You can kill these kind of cells. There is more. Um... And then you have regulatory T cells that we have seen before, right? That came out of the thymus as well. And these cells, they can kind of inhibit the action of these effector T cells. We do not only have regulatory T cells, but then also we have other inhibitory cytokines and we have also inhibitory receptors. I don't know if you have heard about, for example, the checkpoint inhibitors we use in cancer therapy. So there is, for example, PD-1, which is one of the molecules that got a Nobel Prize some years ago. Um, we can stop these kind of regulatory processes. So this would be something that would stop the cell from acting. And if we hinder this, we can make this cell reactive against cancer, but also we induce a lot of immune autoimmune responses uh, because this is a very, very important mechanism uh, in patients or in all of us to keep track of the T cells. Okay. So in essence, I want you to remember that T cell responses are very, very tightly regulated and there are many, many mechanisms to regulate them. So if you go back to our, what do we need to get an autoimmune disease? We have seen that the autoreactive naive T cells, we counter them by central tolerance. Central tolerance in the thymus and the bone marrow. The induction of autoreactive cells Either we don't give access to antigen because we have immunoprivileged sites, or we kind of have the peripheral tolerance that regulates them not to be co-stimulated uh, and to regulate them to stop immune responses. So you see, I mean, you know, I'm from Switzerland, it's like a Swiss cheese, and then all these holes in the Emmentaler, they all need to be you know, aligned so that we can go through and have autoimmunity and then autoimmune disease. Now the question is, how could vaccination induce autoimmune disease? So two sites or two parts of it where we could act with vaccines would be the vaccine antigen could be similar to our self-antigen, right? And so the body doesn't know that it's reacting against itself because it thinks it reacts against the vaccine. And this is called molecular mimicry. And the other part would be that there is kind of the whole predisposition that has happened. And then we just give the danger signal. So we give a huge inflammation and then we could trigger the self-reactivation. And if this is true, we would imagine that if I already have an autoimmune disease and I have autoreactive T cells, if I then give a vaccine, well, then my disease must get worse, no? Because I kind of give them just another danger push. So these two points I would like to look at to, into with you and give you some examples to better see how and why and if this is some mechanisms that could work. So if you look at the first one, which is the mo molecular or epitope mimicry, there is two cells, B cells and T cells. And so the most likely, I showed you, the less well-regulated is B cells, right? And we know that everybody has some kind of autoantibodies in their body against something, right? So most of the autoimmune um, reactions, they are B cell dependent. 
What do I need? I don't need vaccine antigen that is similar to some functionally relevant protein or structure in the body. So this is called the B-cell epitopes. No? And then I showed you, we need the bar, right? So we need to have T-cell epitopes included. You remember pure polysaccharides are not presented by T-cells, for example, right? But then if you conjugate them to something, the T-cells also have a protein or peptide to recognize, so they have something to work on. And so this would be a T-cell epitope that we give with a B-cell epitope. Right? And then I need some huge inflammation, so for example, some adjuvant. So to be a little bit less theoretical and a bit more practical, there's some examples, not not only in vaccination, but especially in infection, we all know, right, that lots of infections can induce some autoantibodies and, and diseases. One example we talked about before is um, measles and rubella, the thrombocytopenia that can occur, is the simple fact that there is autoantibodies that are cross-reactive with some glycoprotein on platelets. And so after vaccination, but even more so after infection, we kill the platelets, and so we don't have them right away, but then they come back. Another example, which is uh, very clinical uh, and, and also kind of pediatric, pediatric uh, in many countries, the group A streptococcus infection. We know that there's a lot of rheumatic diseases coming with it and a lot of like, heart joints, kidneys, and everything. And one example is the M protein of the streptococcus pyogenes that is cross-reactive, or antibodies against these are cross-reactive, for example, with some cardiac muscle structures. And then, last but not least, and this is really not exhaustive, right? There is the adenovirus vector COVID-19 vaccines, and we have seen that the adenovector virus, there must be something where you have cross-reaction with the PF4, PFA4 on platelets, and so we have some cases where people develop uh, thrombocytopenia after vaccination, and this could be one mechanism. And then T cell autoimmune reactions, they are very rare. T cells themselves, we also call them promiscuous because they can kind of recognize many things with their T cell um, receptor, but then they're really tightly uh, regulated. And so these events are more rare. The other question is what I told you, if you have vaccine and we have autoimmunity, then, you know, we kind of should induce uh, these autoimmune diseases and have like flares and relapses. To make the slide short, there is no evidence, but I show you for several vaccines. So there is, when we look into mostly adjum adjuvanted vaccine, there was a study in 2001 that has been done with many of the current mono or multivalent vaccines. There was no increase of relapse of multiple sclerosis after these vaccinations. If you look into Shingrix, there's a study was done in rheumatic disease patients, um, no increase in flares. Uh, the pandemic um, vaccine with the ASO3 adjuvantation, uh, small sample size, but still no increase in, in rheumatic disease flares. And then now the COVID-19 vaccines, there are some studies that has been done with 6,500 and, and 1,700 um, patients. And there was also no increase in, in, um, in flares or exacerbation. So in all, you can see um, that we need, we need these patients to be vaccinated because we need to protect them against many diseases. And there is no evidence that there is an increase um, in flares in these diseases. So I would like to end with a case study um, about the uh, association between the pandemics, va pandemics vaccine and narcolepsy. And you see here an, a review um, from 2015. Can the truth ever be un unraveled? Well, 10 years later, probably um, you will see, perhaps not. Um, but I will show you some of the, the evidence that has been shown. Narcolepsy is uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. And it, the classical type, you have cataplexy, which means you suddenly lost muscle tone, you have emotions, and you just drop. The age of onset is really early. It's mostly in adolescence. And then there is 10 to 15% younger than 10 years old. The pathophysiology, you have uh, hypocreatine, which is, um, which is a, a neurotransmitter that is deficient in the hypothalamus. And it's thought to be an autoimmune disease. 
the risk factors, they are multiple. So we think there's multiple hits that can lead to this disease. One is a genetic predisposition. This is the phenotype that comes with it. Very frequent in European, Northern European countries, less frequent in other types and other parts of the world. Environmental factors are always very vague, but also triggering events like infections, for example, influenza infection or group A streptococcus infections. So what's all about narcolepsy, the pandemic um, infections and, and one of the pandemic f uh, flu vaccines? So there is an association between narcolepsy and influenza infection alone. Here you see a graph from Beijing in China, um, where you have over the years, the seasonality from 1996 to 2010 of, um, of patients that have uh, narcolepsy. And you see it's like every time uh, just after the, the flu season, right, that they have cases. And then here you see the H1N1 um, pandemic uh, flu peak. And afterwards you have an increase in patients. And these patients were mostly not vaccinated. So there is an association between influenza, infection and narcolepsy. And then there were um, some countries, especially in Europe, uh, who have used the pandemics vaccine in children. Um, and you see here a meta-analysis, and these are some of the countries, and there was an increase in cases after the pandemics um, vaccination uh, in those countries, which was a sign which has been uh, followed up, etc. cetera. Um, and um, these were the countries around the time of vaccination it was shortly after or during the peak of infections. There are other countries where it hasn't been seen. These other countries have used other vaccines that had the same adjuvant, uh, that had, didn't have the peak at the same time, uh, etc. But there are many countries in which it has been shown that there was this association. So there is kind of consistency of evidence and the strength of association for uh, narcolepsy and influenza and for the use of pandemics um, vaccine. Um, however, the the biological plausibility, there's no conclusive immune mechanism identified so far, even more than 13 years later. Many people work on autoantibodies, they work on T cell, etc. But there is there's lots of hypotheses, but there is not one real answer to the question how uh, has this uh, happened? And one of the hypotheses that one could raise is is the adjuvanted vaccine, the adjuvanted flu vaccine, which has been given a temporal, close temporal relationship to the, to the pandemic peaks, could this have amplified the mechanism in, by which influenza induces an narcolepsy? And it just happened at the same time. So this is the last uh, slide and very briefly. Um, now, when you want to design a vaccine, can we do something in advance and what can we do? So the first question you will ask yourself is, if I have an infection like group A streptococcus, this induces autoimmune disease. So which are the targets and how does it happen? So I will avoid to use the same antigen, right, in my design of, of vaccine. Then I can do some bioinformatics and immunological approaches. I can look into, is there any HLA molecules that are associated, the genetic predisposition, with some autoimmune diseases. And if I know B cells auto-react against this type of human, like this type of structure, and can try to take out this epitope from my antigen, right? So that I don't make B cells that are specific against something of my cell. Then we can try and test this in like mice models or autoimmune models in preclinical phases. We could um, you do clinical surveillance and I mean, you could do some autoimmune serology when you do your phase one and two trial, but the problem is it's not adapted to detect these kind of really rare events and just having some autoantibodies against something, as I showed you, it's called autoimmunity, but it doesn't mean disease. So it's really, really hard to assess. And then the other is, I mean, one thing is including autoimmune patients who are already sick in your phase four trials. Uh, I mean, in, in the, just to see. Do they flare? Is there anything what I can see here? And especially including autoimmune diseases in the post-marketing uh, monitoring, because it's really very events, is something that seems to be important to find signals, right, if there is any, anything. So what I've shown you today and what I would like you to keep in mind, especially for this evening, is uh, it's this evening your QCMs, right? Your multiple choice questions, no? Yeah. Um, so vaccine-induced unexpected immune diseases, they exist, but they are very rare. 
And you know, this, the learning spiral, you have heard it once, you have heard it twice. This evening, you're going to re respond right. And then you go home next week and then you know everything, no? So you will remember these things. The, the next is many regulatory mechanisms there in, in place to prevent autoimmune diseases, such as central and peripheral tolerance. Autoimmunity is not autoimmune disease. B cell mediated immune disease is mediated by cross reactive antibodies, right? And they can follow vaccination and is much more frequent than T cell mediated events that are rare because T cells are really, really tightly regulated. And probably they need more to be an individual predisposition already for an autoimmune disease to be able to then proceed to become sick. So, do you have any questions? This is Geneva, by the way, very close. So, in case this weekend you don't know what to go, where to go, Sunday to Geneva. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for a beautiful lecture. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Just two brief questions. So can we make a generic recommendation saying that it's okay to vaccinate for all pre-existing condition? That's one. Sorry, can I, can I answer one? But I have kind of a, you know, placenta sure. brain. So I can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, the, the, so if we can vaccinate, uh, people who have autoimmune disease. Yeah. Pre-existing condition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it okay to make a generic stay, uh, recommendation? Yeah. So these people are often under immune suppressive treatment, no? So these people are at higher risk to develop certain diseases, for example, COVID-19, right? And we had kind of a dilemma with the COVID-19 vaccination because we had the vaccine. Obviously, they were excluded from the early trials, no? Because uh, they are immunocompromised, but they need to be protected. So everybody started vaccinating them. And, you know, we need a register, obviously, to look into if there is any effect. So we need to follow them closely. But they are most likely the patients who mostly benefit from the vaccination. So if this is, for example, a non-live vaccine, right? then definitely it's something uh, where we should even vaccinate them, but we should also closely follow and be sure that there is no event that we miss. But these people are mostly the ones who benefit, so the answer is yes. And this may be a second question in terms of, I think, just how do you distinguish, right, like post-vaccination that uh, if somebody develops an autoimmune disease versus an EFI? So. Yeah, it, it is really, really complicated, as I have shown you. So one thing is all the four criteria that I haven't really gone into it. So if you see all of a sudden a spike in some diseases or at an age in several cases where you have these huge registers, you have a signal. And then you would go further into, and then you would try to understand if there are any bi biological plausibility for this, why this has happened, right? So I think you always investigate and you, you don't, you know, kind of say, oh, that's nothing. But then it, there needs to be more than just it happened afterwards. That's not enough. It's like the cat sitting on the on the roof, right? Um, so you need to, to have more than just one or two cases. When we have case reports, that's something like right now in the literature, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult because there's always one case or another case that has happened, but this is not enough. This gives us a hypothesis and this invites us to do larger studies and to look into a big register to see then if there's a real signal or if this is the baseline. We, I mean, every day we have patients that we diagnose with autoimmune diseases and they might have just received yesterday a vaccine, but they have also perhaps, you know, they went to the cinema yesterday. And, and what ha what is what, right? So yeah, this is something, yeah. I hope it answered your question. I think I'd like to re reiterate yeah. something you said, uh, and that is that studies are should be conducted in a number of places yeah. and covering all the different uh, immunocompromised uh, groups yeah. uh, and autoimmune diseases group, and that should be planned somehow. Yeah. It is quite disorganized today. Yeah. So I think that would be one. So I, I'm going to pick uh, individuals that have not asked anything this morning. So please start. Hi, I'm Tanya Wee from Thailand. So when you mentioned that it's very difficult to pick the autoimmune diseases because it's rare, and uh, most of the mechanism is related to the antigen mimicry. So I just wonder that during vaccine development, when you design antigen, are there a way or system that you can like preemptive check before you use that antigen to to make sure that it's less likelihood to have like immune mediated process? Yeah, very good question. So very often you vaccinate against some disease, not a disease that has been on the market <laughs> for a while. 
And so, you know, for first thing is if there is any autoimmune disease that happened with the disease and the disease is most, is a very strong um, danger signal, for example, right? So if a disease makes an autoimmune disease, then if you create your vaccine against this, you will have to understand against what the disease cross-reacts in the bodies. And then this, you will obviously, it's a no-go to include this into a vaccine, right? I have seen some... <laughs> But um, but then the other mechanisms is, I mean, you have bioinformatic platforms, et cetera, when you can kind of screen and go further and see if you find something or not. The other side of the balance is you need to vaccinate against the disease. So you need to have the epitopes that are important to protect against the disease to be in the vaccine. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So it's it's a bit complicated. And I, I'm perhaps not in the position to really tell you how to do it. Um, but I'm sure that there is many colleagues from uh, from pharma who are into the very early phases of, of vaccine development, also with whom you we can or you can discuss. But um, there is things, yes, there's platforms and you have to look in advance, but you cannot rule out everything. Yeah. Please. Hi, I'm Sornendo from India. Um, so like we learned yesterday that T cells could be necessary for preventions in infections uh, from the Lambert talk. And probably the new vaccines coming up would also try to target T cells for therapeutic mm -hmm. effects like HPV and even to deregulate the uh, T cells for certain vaccines like TB. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, are there, you know, very early markers which can suggest uh, the increase in auto autoimmune probabilities between naive, predisposed and vaccinated individuals mm -hmm. for B and T cells? Yeah. Cells? So it's a very good question and it's very difficult to, to assess. So, um, we all have T cells because we, as we said, they are promiscuous, right? So one T cell is specific to something, but can recognize also something else. And the peptides that recognize are really short. So if we test now everybody amongst us, we will find some T cells that are specific to something that is in our body, but it doesn't mean that they will induce a disease in us, right? So doing, using this as a marker first is, is very difficult, right? Because we would say, okay, you have this, so I don't give you the vaccine. And so you cannot benefit from the vaccine. So this is, is very difficult. Then um, there is T cells that are activated will induce cytokines, right? Produce cytokines, but measuring these just like this doesn't mean anything because it's not specific, no? So because I can have another infection at the same time and then I have interferon gamma in my blood that's higher. So it doesn't tell us everything. So it's really, really complicated um, to, to have early biomarkers or biomarkers. It unfortunately would, would ask for having, having symptoms. But also, on the other hand, we're kind of reassured because if you want to make vaccines that are T cells that are directed against something and they are very potent, it's it's kind of difficult to to make them. No? So I'm I'm kind of confident that it might not be so easy to make a T cell that is going to affect something uh, in the patient that is not supposed to be to be affected. Right? Is this answering your question? Um, uh, I was hoping, like, uh, if there are studies which. Uh identify the markers uh, yeah pre-vaccination and post-vaccination uh, um not that i'm aware of yeah in the corner please um i wanted to ask because now we talk about autoimmune disease but of course um, um vaccination has been often brought in relation to allergies um, which is very difficult topic and very broad and a different immune yeah. uh, uh, process. But can you elaborate? Do you know something about that? And can you do you know what are the? Um, yeah, do, can you uh, yeah. reflect on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there is uh, allergies following vaccination, right? But this mechanism is very, very different compared to what we see now, right? Here, we want to target something of ourselves that induces a disease, right? Like a autoimmune disease. Whereas you remember that allergies are IgE mediated, right? And it's, it's another, it's already another type of lapse between vaccination and appearance of allergies. So here we talk about weeks and weeks and allergies. I mean, if you have an anaphylactic shock, it arrives. I mean, you get the after 10 minutes or 30 minutes, you have your allergy, right? So this is something which is very, very different from here. I don't, I don't, I don't think I don't really understand the question, but there is allergies, obviously. Um, and, and there, they are immune mediated, obviously, because they are IgE, uh, mediated. 
um, but they occur at a very different time. So you can distinguish them and their symptoms are different. You can distinguish them from autoimmune diseases. The question was actually like, do you think as an immunologist that there's a relation between allergy and vaccinations? I'm not ah, talking about that. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry. So if I somebody is allergic, allergic, if he's more prone to do an allergy against the vaccine? No, like, of course, we know anaphylactic shock. So then the allergy is co connected with the vaccine or, you know, with us. But I'm talking in generally, like there's like in the public, a lot of, and we talk also mm -hmm. about hesitancy and we talk yeah, about sure. uh, So... In the public, there's a lot of um, debate uh, about if allergies in general, the outcome of allergies last decades are related to the use of vaccines. Ah. And I just was wondering if you okay. have any reflection on that yeah. or any yeah. broad idea about yeah. that. Um, so there's another graph where autism uh, increases with time and also the consumption of organic food increases with time, right? So it's kind of a similar thing. So there is uh, an increase in allergy and there's many hypotheses why, but it's not the link to the use uh, of vaccination, obviously. I mean, you have allergic reactions to vaccines, but in general, having more allergies is not because we vaccinate children and then afterwards they develop allergies. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Good talk. Alpha Diallo from me in San Paris. Uh, I return the fact uh, there are rarity about uh, this uh, autoimmune disease post vaccination. But on the other hand, as you showed, we know that the diagnosis of this kind of event is very complicated. In some countries, we do have some reference centers who can help physician to, to make the diagnosis. Do you consider uh, the under-reporting of this kind of event, even in the context of uh, LMIC countries, that will be very complicated? Uh, in the fact that the T cells are more rare than the B cell uh, mediated diseases? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very good question. So I think um, the immunology-wise uh hypothetically and what we have seen in 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 some of the countries where a lot of things have been assessed this is what we we saw that there is a you know that b cells are more easily uh, producing auto um, antibodies compared to t cells that are auto reactive but then are not regulated so i think this is something that holds true despite under reporting i would like to refer perhaps um to the talk that comes um, this afternoon uh, from Philippe, uh, who talks about uh, the the, um, uh, the the reporting in, in, in other countries, right, and, and see how this affects um, some of the diseases. But immunologically wise, um, I think this this is true in in many countries or in all countries. Right? Obviously, there's genetic predisposition. What you have seen with narcolepsy, uh, where of this kind of phenotype is like Northern Europe, uh, where like 20 or 30 percent of the population have this phenotype, whereas in other countries, very few have these, right? So some diseases you're more prone to in some different countries, and this is specific to countries. But in general, the fact of T-cell and B-cell, I am kind of confident about the difference. So one last question. Yes. We need to... <laughs> right. So um, a lot of infections are also associated with other yes. diseases. Isn't the risk-benefit balance always in favor of vaccination? Yeah. Uh, definitely. So very, very good question. Um, we talk about uh, Guillain Barré. Uh, we talk about, um, for example, these uh, ITP or in general measles diseases and just this kind of little thing that happens. So um, most of the, like the vaccines that are made to prevent these diseases and there is a burden of disease. So that's why you want to vaccinate. So yes, um, for these rare events, um, you have to tell your patient it can happen, but if you get the infection, it will happen more likely, right? And and the difference is like tenfold, hundredfold, it depends on what it is. So it's it's a huge difference between vaccination and infection. Thank you for raising this because I think I didn't make it really clear. I was like kind of a little bit inside there, but it's a very, very important point. So yes, infections induce autoimmune diseases and it's if it's done so by vaccines, it's much rarer and the benefit of vaccination is most likely to be higher. Everybody has to assess it, but yes, that's a very, very good even last sentence i think perfect ending yeah